Hi, Don. Hey, Bob. How are you doing? Pretty good. How about yourself? I can't complain. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show. You are Donald Hoffman at University of California at Irvine. Um, you're a cognitive scientist, uh, and you've written books with titles like Visual Intelligence about the process of, of uh, perception and, and, and seeing reality. What we're going to talk about today is kind of at the intersection of cognitive science and philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to talk about the mind-body problem, the question of what consciousness is, um, and a question that's raised by your particular theory of consciousness, which uh, is, so far as I know, quite distinctive, unlike anything I've heard before. Okay. Um, and that, that question is whether what we think we see is really real or how close to real it is. Your, your right. theory of consciousness, which, is, which is, uh, has been getting attention uh, among the, the people who think about these things, uh, your theory suggests that things are not as real as we think they are. This bottle of water, it's useful, useful for me to think I see it, but, but it may not be, uh, bear a very close correspondence to the underlying reality, right? Cor correct. It's, it's real as an experience, but um, it may not exist apart from my experience in that form. Right. Now, your uh, theory builds on the following, um, <clears throat> I think, fact about natural selection. I don't, I don't think this is really disputed, which is to say that, strictly speaking, uh, natural selection doesn't build a brain that sees the truth. I mean, that's not what the criterion of natural selection is. The criterion is natural selection will preserve traits that are conducive to the proliferation of genes. And so it will build brains yes. that have the kinds of perceptions and thoughts that are conducive to the proliferation of genes. And if those perceptions and thoughts are false, but still are conducive to the proliferation of genes, then there will be faults perceptions. I, I, I think that's actually uncontroversial, right, in, Absolutely. in evolutionary biology. And, and, and some, some kind of mundane reflections of that are well known. Uh, so, for example, if you imagine a species that grows up amid poisonous snakes, um, you, it would probably make sense uh, when you're walking through the brush and there's anything that makes the kind of noise a snake makes, it probably makes sense to like get alarmed and even think you see a snake, even if nine times out of 10 there is no snake, that still is on balance a healthy policy. And so that will lead to the actual illusion of snakes. You know, yes. you'll sometimes think you see a snake when it's uh, just a lizard or, or something else. Um, but natural selection favors that kind of perceptual bias because it, it helps you stay alive long enough to get your genes in the next generation. Now that's a mundane reflection right. Of this, and, and, and so too are a lot of uh, you know famous optical illusions. Those are also reflections of this in, in, in ways I don't think we need to get into. But you are you're you're taking this 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 kind of fact about natural selection and making a much deeper claim about its implications. Yes. For <clears throat> perception, right? Do you want to talk about that a little? That's right. So. The standard view in the field, I think, is the one that you just described, that, that of course, um, natural selection is, in the first instance, only about um, propagating the genes, propagating the species, and perceptions that do that are the ones that will survive. And I think nobody argues with that. But the, the assumption in the field has been that the, the perceptual strategies that will actually be favored by that kind of natural selection are perceptual strategies that see reality as it is. Not, now, not exhaustively. No one, very, very few people would claim that we see all of reality as it is. Mm -hmm. But that those aspects of the world that we do see, we do see accurately. And we see the ones that we need um, to survive and, and reproduce. And so the, the assumption has been that, therefore, that veridical perceptions perceptions that are accurate to the state of the world, not exhaustively, but about those parts of the world that we need to know about, vertical perceptions are the ones that are favored by natural selection. That's the textbook assumption, it's the assumption by most researchers in the field, but it's, it's an assumption that we don't have to just wave our hands about, we can actually 
go and check it because evolution is a mathematically precise theory. We have the tools of evolutionary game theory, evolutionary graph theory, and even genetic algorithms where we can actually go and, and ask what does the mathematical theory of evolution do? What, what does it do to vertical perception? Does it favor them? Does it make them proliferate? Or does it drive them to extinction? So can I just uh, get clear on the terminology? Uh, in, in the example I gave, if it's a veridical perception in your terms, that would mean the snake is actually there. Veridical means right. accurately representing reality, right? Exactly. And most people in the field, in the field of perceptual science, would say that there is a real three-dimensional world with right. real physical objects like snakes in it. Right. And when you see a snake, when you have the perceptual experience that you describe as a snake, that perceptual experience is a veridical representation of a true snake mm -hmm. in objective reality that mm -hmm. would exist whether or not you perceive it. As a rule. Now, now it is conventionally acknowledged that there are the exceptions, like where sure. you think, oh, that's a snake, when there's not, because you, you err on the side of caution, and a few other examples like that. But, but and maybe this is a good distinction yes. to make. I mean, people agree that it will give rise, uh, that, that natural selection will, will create brains that give rise to the illusion of a snake in certain cases, but that often when you see a snake, the snake is really there. And what you're saying is, no, the snake is not necessarily ever there in, in a sense. That, that, that's right. So you're right that the standard assumption is that our perceptions are vertical under normal circumstances. Right. Most of, course, of the time. Of course, you get someone in a psychologist lab, all bets are off. Right. And there are rare circumstances where our perceptions will fail to be veridical. But the standard assumption is that under normal circumstances, we will see those aspects of reality accurately that mm -hmm. we need to see accurately. Mm -hmm. And that was the assumption that I decided to test. And initially, I, I was skeptical about it because I thought, um, well, reality is pretty complicated. And there are all sorts of selection pressures to do things fast and cheap. And so maybe perceptual systems may not go after the, uh, you know, vertical perceptions of the world simply because um, they're very expensive. And so that was my assumption going into it, that that might be the interesting result. But it turned out to I me mean, that that's true, that, um, you know, we try to do things faster and cheaper because, you know, every calorie you spend on perception is a calorie that you have to, to get somehow. You have to go out and kill something and eat it to get that calorie. And so other things being equal, we try to do things on the cheap and do them quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and that certainly turned out to be true in the, you know, the Monte Carlo simulations that we, that we ran of you know, evolutionary game theory. But the deeper result that, that in retrospect I should have seen you know, up front, but I didn't, was that um, fitness functions, which are the, you know, the bread and butter of evolution, they're, you know, how, how you get your fitness points from your actions, fitness functions are a function of the real state of the world, whatever that world might be, mm -hmm. but they're not identical to the world. They're, they're functions on the world. And the key idea is that fitness functions, uh, and I'll, we can say what, you know, we can talk in detail about what fitness functions yeah. are. I don't, I don't think we probably need to, I mean, I mean let, let, let me, and let me make sure I understand. I mean, basically, I think you, you know, you can do computer simulations of evolution, and, and, right. and, and you did computer simulations, which I gather, showed what we just said, that when there's a difference between seeing things truly and seeing things that will get your genes into the next generation, whether right. or not they're really there, the perceptions that will evolve are those that get your genes into the next generation, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and I guess I have, we needn't spend much time on this, but I have a kind of a question about that, which is, it's almost like why you bother doing the simulation, since it's almost true by de it's really true by definition that if natural selection has to choose between a true perception and a perception that gets genes in the next generation, the latter will be the perception that transpires, right? So right. I, I right. kind of it, it seems to me you could have just asserted that as as something as an axiom that's true by definition, and then gotten on with your with your philosophy, which we'll get on with shortly. But am yes. I missing something as to why you actually needed to do the simulations? Pretty much the reason I did the simulations because everybody else in the field, in, in the field of perceptual science, um, actually stated in print pretty much mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. vertical perceptions were the ones that were more fit. Mm -hmm. So they, they understood that it's all about fitness, but then they conflated fitness with okay. vertical yeah. perceptions. They said that if 
that the reasons our perceptions are useful evolutionarily mm -hmm. is because they're true. Okay. And it was that it was that identification of the of the evolutionary usefulness of our perceptions with them being true that I wanted to test because everybody was making that assumption. Okay. Uh, and and there is, is the fact that although fitness does depend on the state of the world, it's not the same thing as the right. state of the world. So and so whenever like, the two diverge... Sounds like you needed to convince some people who perhaps were uh, not sufficiently steeped in the logic of natural selection, and so you did a computer simulation. But but, right. in, but in any event, let's accept the... Uh, let's definitely stim stipulate the premise um, mm -hmm. that non-veridical perceptions um, will will prevail... In, in natural selection, if that's what gets genes into the next generation, and, and, and let's let, let's uh, do what you do with that, which is to take it to a much kind of deeper level than I had seen it taken, and, and, and maybe maybe you could explain to us your kind of desktop computer metaphor yes. for what the relationship is between what we think is reality and actual re reality. Uh, okay, very good. So the first thing I should say is that I'm not a so-called metaphysical solipsist, which is a person who claims that there's nothing that exists except for me and my perceptions. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm not a solipsist of that variety. I think that there is some kind of objective reality, and it'll exist whether or not I exist. Uh, and I have life insurance, so I'm putting my money where my mouth is. <laughs> but the, the, the question is, uh, if evolution has not shaped our perceptions to resemble that objective reality, mm -hmm. It's just given us a, a set of symbols that are species-specific guides to keep us alive. Then how should we understand the nature of those perceptions? Most people in perceptual psychology assume that what we're seeing just is the surface of objective reality in some sense. And evolution is very, very clear that that's not the case. So how should we think of our perceptions? And so the, the metaphor that I think is very, very helpful is the metaphor of the desktop interface on, on your computer. Mm -hmm. And suppose you have on your desktop um, an icon that's, say, blue and rectangular, and in the lower right-hand corner of the screen, and it's for, you know, say, uh, an email message you're creating or, or a paper you're writing. Um, you can ask yourself, um, if that icon is blue and rectangular, does that mean that the email message itself or the file that you're writing is blue and rectangular? And, and the answer is, of course, of course not. That's, that's silly. Anybody who thought that the color of the icons on the desktop or their shapes or their position um, in some sense was meant to reflect the true colors and true shapes and positions of the, of the file on the computer, that, that just misunderstands the whole point of the interface. The interface is there not to show you the complex reality of the computer, like the diodes and resistors and the voltages and magnetic fields. It's, it's not there to show you that. In fact, it's there to hide that. We pay good money for the interface software um, because we don't want to know that stuff. It's mm -hmm. irrelevant to what we really want to do, like sending emails and editing photos and so forth. Because it's for practical purposes a more efficient description of reality. To Absolutely. see an icon is a, a more useful perception um, then to see a bunch of electrons bumping into each other on a circuit board or whatever Absolutely. the underlying reality is. And as we've said, uh, natural selection will favor perceptions that are efficient in the sense of getting genes into the next generation most exactly. efficiently. So, exactly. So, so the idea then is that we've, uh, natural selection has endowed us with a species-specific user interface. Uh, our, you know, space and time, the three dimensions of space as we perceive them, um, are the desktop, and physical objects are the icons. Okay, so it isn't just objects that are in some sense not real. You're saying space-time is itself just a convenient projection. Now, you said species-specific. Would, wouldn't you, I would think that kind of all the species we're familiar with would find, uh, they don't think about a space-time continuum, but they're... I would imagine that certainly dogs are seeing three dimensions and are in some sense implicitly assuming that some things come after others. I mean, is it really, is it species specific, the, the, the projection of space time, or is it just um, more like uh, specific to life? Well, there may be some aspects of the user interface that is common across 
some species. Mm -hmm. But I would imagine that E. coli, for example, doesn't have very much of a 3D representation of space, perhaps. I mean, it, it certainly is plausible to me that it might not. If it, if it did, I would be interested to find out that it did, but it's, it's certainly at least reasonable to me to think that it doesn't. And so, so I don't want to take any aspect of the human perceptual system, the, or the human species specific interface, as necessarily true of any other species. I think we need to look case by case and see um, what evidence we might have that the interfaces of other species are like our own. Okay. E even within Homo sapiens, it, I mean, there are mutations, and it's not at all clear that your interface is exactly the same as mine. I would think that they're relevantly similar, mm -hmm. and that's why we can communicate pretty well, but they're you know, evolution is continuing, and so your interface is probably a little bit different from mine. So even when I speak about a species-specific interface, I'm, I'm, I'm being a little bit loose there because your interface is not exactly the same as mine. Mm -hmm. So um, let me try to uh, pursue a, a kind of a computer-like analogy a little. Um, it's a little bit like... Um, well, I, I guess the question is, uh, the question that will naturally occur to people is, well, what is the real world like then? And what is the real world? You, you do refer to a world, and I, I, I'd be tempted to say on the basis of your metaphor that, okay, reality is as different from what we perceive as a bunch of electrons bumping into each other on a circuit board and, and, and moving in certain patterns are different from uh, file folders on our computer. Um, but I actually think your theory is a little weirder than, than that, in a sense. When I've, when I've heard you describe what you think the world is, it's not as straightforward an extension of that analogy as I might have hoped. You know what I mean? Right. And I would assume that at this point, a lot of people start having trouble wrapping their minds around things. Do you, do you want to talk a little about, like, if I ask you the question, okay, what is reality like? I mean, if the analogy, in a certain sense, is kind of like, I'm a creature in a video game like Pac-Man or some newer video game running around the screen, seeming to see things and responding to obstacles by moving around them, but in fact those obstacles are illusory, they're just pixels, and really the action is being governed by these electrons on the, on the circuit board. I mean, it's my temptation to think of it that way, but I actually think things, in your view, are weirder than that, right? That, that's right. So the, the starting point is the recognition that, that the very language of our perceptions of space and time and physical objects with matter and shapes and colors and so forth. Um, that very language has been shaped by natural selection simply to keep us alive, not to tell us anything about the nature of objective reality as it is. Mm -hmm. and so there's no reason to believe that any of that language, any of the predicates of that language, and anything that could be described in that language is going to be the nature of the objective world. And, that, and that's pretty strong. What that means is that whatever objective reality is, the chances that thinking about it in terms of space and time and matter and physical objects and colors and shapes is, is just the wrong language. You'll get nowhere. The, the analogy would be, suppose I said, uh, I would like you to tell me what it, a, a detailed theory of the inner workings of a computer but the only language I'm going to let you use is the language of the pixels on your desktop. Mm -hmm. So you have positions and colors of pixels. That's your language. Go for it. Try as best you can to describe how a computer works. Good luck. I have, I've made it impossible for you because I've given you a language that's not the right language to do the job. Mm -hmm. And so that's the same problem that we have when we start trying to think of using the language of space and time and position, momentum, spin, shape, mass, and matter to describe the objective reality. We're, we've, we've given ourselves an impossible task, just like asking ourselves to describe a computer just based on the pixels on the desktop. So what we have to do is to be willing to, to let go altogether of some very deeply held beliefs um, that there's any resemblance whatsoever between the nature of our perceptions and even the language of our perceptions and the nature of objective reality. That's a very, very difficult 
position for us to take. We seem to be very, very wedded to the idea that we that our perceptions are giving us some kind of insight into the nature of reality. At least the language of our perceptions is the right language to describe reality. And that's what I'm saying we need to call into question. Mm-hmm. Now, so... so and, and by the way, one of the things you're calling into question, I'm not sure if you mentioned this in your list, but is causality itself. So... Absolutely. If you, if you see billiard balls bumping into each other on a computer and, and it looks like the, the ball is causing the other ball to move, well, you know that's not really happening on your computer screen. There's not causality happening on the screen. Rather, right. they're both just a, a behaving in accordance with the script. You're saying the causality we think we... And this has been uh, suggested by philosophers like Hume and so on, that, sure. that, that we can't really confidently infer actual causality. We never really know more than that certain things regularly precede other certain things and so on. We never know for sure that causality per se happens. Anyway, that's another weird thing about your, your theory. That, that, that's right. So, so I'm, I don't necessarily need to give up the notion of causality of some kind of entities... But so I'm, I'm happy to con- you contemplate the idea that, that the notion of causality itself is not a fiction, but that the uh, that the specific causality that we all know and love, <laughs> namely that a physical object like a billiard ball hitting another billiard ball and and making it move, that that's genuine causality. Um, that I think we will have to give up. So when one you know the eight ball hits the white ball hits the eight ball <laughs> mm-hmm. into the corner pocket, we can say that the, you know the cue ball caused the eight ball to move. And and for practical purposes, that's that's fine. It's a useful fiction, but strictly speaking, it's a fiction. There is perhaps some causal sequence going on in the objective world, and all I can do as a humble member of the species Homo sapiens is to represent it in terms of a cue ball hitting an eight ball mm-hmm. and having a fiction of a causal causal interaction between those two. And, and by the way, in some scenarios where causality is an illusion people are actually talking about a completely deterministic universe, so what they're really doing is just watching a movie and everything has been prescribed from the beginning and the, the, the idea of like causality is false. Yours is not necessarily, as I understand it, a completely determined universe. At least you use terms like choice in your theory, which we'll get into yes. a little, right? So, so you're not talking about a deterministic uh, universe necessarily. Not, not necessarily a deterministic universe. Okay. And, and I should point out that there, um, that the, the theory that I'm working here has two separate aspects and that one could buy the one and not the other. So, so the first aspect um, that I'm fairly confident about is that evolution entails that we almost surely do not see reality as it is. Mm-hmm. That, uh, that I'm pretty confident. If, if you buy evolution, then I think that you have to buy the conclusion that space and time and physical objects are a species-specific desktop and not a depiction of reality. Now, once you bought that, there's, you know, we have to give up our, you know, our dearly loved theory that reality resembles what we perceive, and that's hard to give up. But so that that I think just follows from evolution. The next step is to ask what theory of reality shall we propose. And there's an infinite number of possibilities, right? We've thrown away one theory, the one that we happen to like a lot, but it's just one out of an infinite number of possibilities. Mm -hmm. So when I go and propose a specific new theory, um, you know, I'm probably wrong. Um, There's a lot of options out there. Um, So that's that's going to be a far more, you know, problematic direction in in terms of, you know, how confident I am. So Mm -hmm. I, I do have a theory, and I can discuss the theory with you, but I should point out that that theory is separate from the evolutionary conclusion. Okay. The evolutionary conclusion is we don't see reality as it is. The second step is, okay, now as scientific theorists, what shall we propose as a new theory of that reality? Mm-hmm. Um, and so someone can buy my first you know, proposal that we don't see reality as it is and not buy my, my proposal about the nature of reality that I'm going to propose. And the proposal you have, there, there's an actual mathematical version of it. Uh, yes. I think it has maybe seven variables or something like that. And we won't be able to get into that in any um, depth at all. But one interesting feature of it is I think you, you claim it's testable. Right. Um, and so we'll talk about that. Now, before we get into that, I want to get a little uh, more deeply into the question of, okay, if this is not the real world, what is the real world right. that this is a kind of, um, in a certain sense, a reflection of or bears a certain kind of correspondence to? And here's where... Uh, things get uh, 
weirder, as if things weren't weird enough. Um, I, 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 at least by, by my reckoning, as, as I understand huh. it, uh, the world is it that it's kind of co-created by conscious agents, or, 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 or um, I mean, you tell me. You refer in your theory to conscious agents, and I'm not sure if you does a conscious conscious agent correspond to what we would think of as a conscious. Like I'm a conscious agent, you're a conscious agent. Like so, right now we are two conscious agents interacting. Is that is that the, the correct terminology in your theory? Uh, yes. To a first, there's a first step. Yes, but there's more more to it. Um, okay. And so I'll, I'll unpack it just a little bit. So. So here's the motivation for for the direction I've gone. Um, the The idea is, it may be the case that all of my beliefs are false. I may know nothing, and that, that, that that's a serious possibility. There's you know, as scientists, we have to acknowledge that possibility. Mm -hmm. But if there is anything that I believe that's true, it's that I do have conscious experiences. I mean, if I if 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 it if my belief that I'm, you know, feeling a pain or smelling a rose or, or tasting chocolate, if my belief that I'm having an experience is wrong, then I'm pretty much wrong about everything, and we might as well just eat, drink, and be merry because it's, you know, there's really nothing else that we can do as scientists. Yeah, this is a little like what Descartes said. The one, the, you know, the minimalist assumption is that you are having this experience, whether or not the experience is true. Uh, that that that's that's right. I don't want to. Therefore, go to the you know the cogito ergo sum kind of thing. You know, I don't want to perhaps yeah. go where he goes in terms of trying to prove my own existence. But but just merely that if I'm wrong, that there are experiences that I'm then pretty much there's not anything secure that I can mm -hmm. can go with. So I decided to say, okay, let's let's go with that. Let's uh, if if space and time and and matter, um, which are just the format of my perceptual system, is not the right predicates to describe reality. And I can't let go of the idea that I have conscious experiences. Let's just start with consciousness. Let's see if we can get a mathematical theory of consciousness and conscious experiences, but a, a new kind of theory. I mean, there are, there are many um, cognitive neuroscientists and philosophers who are trying to get a theory of consciousness, but the typical approach is to say, let's start with brain activity and say that this kind of brain activity mm -hmm. or this pattern of brain activity is um, consciousness or gives rise to consciousness. So consciousness is secondary to some physical description of the brain mm -hmm. or microtubules in the brain or reentrant thalamal cortical loops in the brain or something like that. And I'm saying, let's not start with our interface of space and time. Let's start with the description of consciousness on its own terms. Mm -hmm. So what do we mean by consciousness? Not as you know, inhabiting space and time because we don't know that it inhabits in space and mm -hmm. time. We just want its own properties on its own. And so the idea is that there are conscious experiences and there are actions that you can take based on those conscious experiences where the you is used in a more generic sense, not you as a person, but you know consciousness itself. And then there is some kind of notion of a choice of the action that you're going to take based on your conscious experiences. Mm -hmm. And then those actions have an effect on the objective reality, whatever it is. And that objective reality, in turn, affects your conscious experiences. And those are the key ingredients that I put together into mm -hmm. a very, very simple mathematical formalism. And, and those things, you kind of have to stick with those premises if you're going to remain within the framework of natural selection, which is the basis of your whole theory anyway. I mean, there, there have right. to be these discrete entities, which we call organisms. That's what they look like to us, whatever they may be at the deepest level, these discrete things that act on the world based on their experiences. And so Absolutely. you're sticking with that at an abstract level, those premises of natural selection, but beyond that uh, lies the weirdness. So, so go ahead. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with what you're saying, and, and it, it is actually in accord with um, what Dawkins and Dennett have called um, um, universal Darwinism. The, the key mm -hmm. um, algorith algorithmic principles underlying Darwinian evolution of replication, retention, um, um, and, and selection. Mm -hmm. And Var variation at some point. I'm sorry, var yeah, variation, yeah. that's right. So, so the, 
so the idea was, and that's what evolutionary game theory is based on, is, is that it's essentially a mathematical representation of universal Darwinism. Mm -hmm. But what it does allow you to do is to um, think about biological evolution without some of the physicalist assumptions that are usually made as well. So that organisms are real physical objects in 3D space and, and DNA is a physical thing that exists in space and time. We don't need to have those assumptions. And in fact, what evolutionary game theory suggests is that those assumptions are actually false. So that we have to rethink Darwinian evolution, uh, in, in, you know, based on evolutionary game theory itself. But, but you're right that the, the theory of conscious agents does still keep the core of, um, you know, Darwinian evolution in terms of the, um, you know, universal Darwinism aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and, and there, there is this idea of Con discrete conscious entities or discrete packages of consciousness that has to be preserved too, right? I, I mean, yes. Consciousness can't just be this uh, undifferentiated mass, universal mass. There have to be discrete incarnate. Well, <laughs> incarnations. In you know what I mean, right? There, 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 well, your theory calls for there to be more than one conscious agent. Absolutely. And, and in fact, uh, perhaps an infinite lattice of them, from the very, very simple to the very, very complex. And it turns out the formalism, so it allows for, for conscious agents, that there's a formal definition of conscious agents, so anything that satisfies that definition is a conscious agent, according to the theory. And they can go all the way from the simplest ones, which have only one bit of experience, literally, uh, essentially one bit of possible experiences and one bit of possible actions, all the way up to, as you know, accountable infinity of of so, so, so the first case is strictly hypothetical. It's not like you think that there is some organism out there that is that has only two, two options in terms of consciousness, right? Well, my, my theory forces me to entertain that possibility and to to you know imagine consciousnesses that are um, you know very very in some sense. Oh, I see. You, so so consciousness may go beyond the organic world in your. Oh, theory. oh well, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. In fact, so what we call a proton. Which of course is not anything like what we conceive it to be in your theory, but whatever it is, it could have consciousness. So this is kind of like what's called panpsychism, which is that everything in the universe is. It's no, it, no, it's not panpsychism, and, and the, but that's a very important distinction. So panpsychism, for example, with respect to electrons and protons, is the uh, is the idea that electrons, in addition to their physical properties like position momentum and spin and so forth, also have consciousness properties. Mm -hmm. But I'm denying that there is such a thing in objective reality as an electron with a position. Right? I'm, I'm saying that the very framework of space and time and matter and spin is the wrong framework, it's the wrong language to describe reality. So, so I'm, I'm in some sense more radical than panpsychism. Mm -hmm. Panpsychism is almost a dualism the way I'm, I'm formulating it. There are physical objects like electrons and in addition to their physical properties they have these consciousness properties. Mm -hmm. I'm saying let's go all the way, it's consciousness and only consciousness all the way down. Nope. So, uh, but it's not a pure idealism as I think you, you know, like like Barclay or whoever, right? It's it's right. It's I, so. Yeah, yeah, for Barclay to be is to be perceived, but the conscious agents um, are perceivers, and they they could be without being perceived. Mm -hmm. um, they might be inert, <laughs> but they but their existence is not mm -hmm. dependent on being perceived. They're they're so it's. It, it's it's got a, my view has a higher affinity with idealism than with panpsychism, but it's one difference. There's a couple differences. First, I like to call my my point of view conscious realism, mm -hmm. um, because I, I want to say that you know it, it's often been put out as realism versus idealism, uh, and I think that's the you know it's just the wrong way to frame the thing. I'm I'm realist about consciousness. Others are realist about physical reality. Mm -hmm. I'm not realist about physical reality. I think that it's 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 part of the user interface of consciousness. But I am very realist about conscious experiences and conscious choices and so forth. So so I call it conscious realism. That the nature of objective reality is consciousness that can be described mathematically. Mm -hmm. Now now for me then to solve the mind body problem, I have to solve it in a different way than everybody else is trying to solve it. Right? Most people 
99% uh, of the researchers trying to solve the mind-body problem are starting with the physical reality, in particular, you know, brain states, brain activity, and they have to show how consciousness might arise from that or be identical to that. Mm -hmm. I have to go the other direction. I start with the mathematical theory of consciousness completely independent of any notion of space, time, or matter. Completely mm -hmm. independent. And it's my burden, then, to say that this mathematical model of consciousness can give rise to all of the modern mathematics of, say, quantum mechanics and general relativity. Okay. It, so if I cannot... If I cannot derive from this theory of conscious agents, um, first, what we already know about quantum, quantum field theory and gravity and then hopefully a new theory of quantum gravity itself, uh, then I'm wrong. It's, it's just that simple. So uh, there can be conscious agents that, I mean, that, that not only don't correspond to electrons well, first of all, there can be conscious agents that don't correspond to any of the physical phenomena we currently describe as part of a scientific framework. Is that right? Don't Absolutely. correspond to protons or anything else. Absolutely. And it isn't just that we, science hasn't yet discovered the physical phenomena that would correspond to the conscious agents. You're saying that in this sense, conscious agents just are more fundamental than what we refer to as the physical world. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so, so first came the conscious agents, and then came the physical world. But see, this is where I get a little uh, caught up with the chicken and egg problem when I start putting this in terms of natural selection, right? I mean, for natural selection to happen, as we conventionally conceive of it, you've got these conscious agents. I mean, we assume that they're conscious. But anyway, we've got these agents... Uh, and then you've got this like world for them to respond to. And it's true that the world consists partly of each other. Bacteria respond partly to each other. Um, but in the first instance, when the first self-replicating form of organic life came into being, it was responding strictly to a physical... So, so it's like the physical world, which we normally conceive of as unconscious, was a given... And then self-replicating things came along and started responding to it. And so in the conventional reckoning, you just have this dichotomy. Right. Now, I recognize that that the that dichotomy in a way rests on the assumption that what we refer to as the inorganic world is not conscious, and you would take issue right. with that assumption. Exactly. But still, I, I can't be alone in having trouble like wrapping my mind around this whole thing and kind of yes. vaguely perceiving a kind of chicken and egg problem, right? Even Absolutely. you must have this problem a little, right? <laughs> uh, well, well, yes, because you know, like everybody else, um, I am you know naturally a, a physicalist and a naive realist. Mm -hmm. I, I believe whenever I'm not thinking carefully, I'm, I always believe just naturally that I'm seeing reality as it is. That's just sort of the the way we've evolved, mm -hmm. and so it's very very difficult to step outside of that um, when evolution itself forces me to to take that idea seriously. But but. The idea is that when I interact with something that to me looks inanimate, like a rock, mm -hmm. um, it doesn't look living to me. And uh, so I'm not saying that the rock itself is conscious, um, but that the rock itself is a symbol that I'm using to represent a reality that is completely unlike a rock, a reality that is not in space and time, mm -hmm. and a reality that is in itself. Uh, a potentially infinitely complex interaction of conscious agents, but because I Wait, have the reality itself is an interaction of conscious agents. Yeah, it's, it's you mean a, including it's, it's, you, or not necessarily including you? Uh, well, I, I'm certainly interacting with it. So uh -huh. yes, but I mean, so, but, but I mean, before you started interacting with it, I mean, you would say, I guess, if it exists in itself, then it itself has to be an interaction of conscious agents. Exactly right. Exactly right. And that's it, the, that's the ontology I'm proposing here. It is conscious agents all the way down, and that's what exists. Even if, if the conscious agent that I call me um, didn't exist, there would be other conscious agents. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I'm interacting with. Now, now, because I'm a finite conscious agent, I have finite representational capabilities. Mm -hmm. This is presumably, though, an infinitely complicated universe of conscious agents. That means that almost all of it is beyond my representational capacity. My ability to represent it uh, I can represent only a probability zero subset of this reality. 
and the parts that I do represent, I mean, so when I interact with you, uh, by looking at your expressions and your body language and so forth, I can get some idea about your conscious state, the kinds of experiences you're having, your mood and so forth. I get some insight into you as a consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, when I interact with my cat, maybe a little bit less. When I interact with a rat, even less. With an ant, even much less. Um, but, and when I get to the point of a rock, I've essentially given up. But in terms of understanding the nature of the consciousnesses, right? But that is a limit of my representational system. And here's the problem that we always have. As humans, we tend to conflate the limits of our representational system with an insight into the nature of reality. Mm -hmm. So we mistake our limits for an insight into the nature of reality. It's, it's like saying that the icons on my desktop only have two-dimensional positions and pixels, therefore reality can only have two dimensions and pixels and nothing else. Mm -hmm. Well, no, that's just a limit of my desktop. If I could just sort of think outside of the box, I would realize that most of the categorizations I make in the world, like between animate and inanimate, are artifacts of the limits of my perceptual system. They're artifacts of the fact that I have to give up at some point in what I can represent of the nature of reality. Mm -hmm. So when I see something that I call a rock um, and then conclude that of course nothing conscious is going on here, what I've done is mistaken <laughs> a deficit of my representational ability for an insight into the nature of reality. Mm -hmm. And that's what we tend to do all the time. So what we have to back off from is, is to say, look, I mean, my, my perceptions are the humble abilities of a particular species, and they're not that very sophisticated. And I just need to understand, I have a very, very limited species-specific set of representations that was just designed to get me through the day, not to give me an insight into reality. When I see a rock, all bets are off about what it is about the objective reality that I'm really interacting with. Mm -hmm. And so my proposal is that, not that the rock itself is conscious, that's, that's, that's silly, but that I'm interacting with a complex world of conscious agents and the best that I can come up with, because I'm a poor, weakly endowed <laughs> conscious agent myself, mm -hmm. the best I can come up with is this stupid little symbol that I call a rock. Mm -hmm. But then because I'm so you know, unimaginative, I assume that the rock in space and time is the final reality, and there's a big distinction between animate and inanimate. Mm -hmm. So it is. I mean, you think about it. It's amazing that, given the fact that our brains were really just designed by natural selection to get us to the point where we could survive in a hunter-gatherer society and navigate the social landscape and everything else, it's just kind of stunning that science has gotten as far as it has gotten. I mean, however misleading you think its representation of reality is, its predictive capabilities are reasonably impressive, and and it's, it's amazing it's gotten as far as it is, and by the same token, it would be kind of shocking if we could see, like, the whole picture, given, right. <laughs> given what natural selection actually designed the brains to do, which is the, the heart of your theory in a certain sense. Absolutely. Now, the, we have to take our cognitive and cognitive capacities one at a time to see what evolution does with them, right? So I... My, my simulations indicate that, and, and those are my graduate students. I should mention, you know, uh, Justin Mark, um, you know, Brian Marion, and Chaitan Prakash, who've been mm -hmm. doing this work with me. Um, our, our work indicates that the probability that our perceptions have been shaped to reflect reality as it is is zero. It's, it's strictly speaking zero. But but there are other cognitive capacities. For example, my ability to reason mathematically. Mm -hmm. Now it turns out that there are circumstances where I do need to reason mathematically about fitness, not about reality as it is, but about fitness. The fitness consequences of eating what I call apples, of getting two apples, might be roughly twice as good as just mm -hmm. one apple. Mm -hmm. um, or um, if in a hunter-gatherer society where we're um, you know, cooperating and having to share, um, I might need to be able to detect a cheater. You only you didn't contribute as much as you could have contributed. I need to be able to quantify how much you contributed, how much mm -hmm. I contributed, uh, and and then you know punish you if you're cheating. Mm -hmm. So in these very limited domains, there mm -hmm. could be selection pressures not to give us like deep insights into mathematics, but just enough mathematics again to survive. Mm -hmm. But that's the interesting thing. Whereas natural selection uniformly gets rid of vertical perceptions. It does not uniformly get rid of vertical math. It gives you little pockets of 
potential veridical math where you can where you need it for just little things like you know checking for cheaters and you know counting apples because of the fitness consequences. So you're, you're suggesting then that our logical intuition, some of our logical intuitions, bear a closer correspondence to a kind of, in some sense, real logic out yes. there that exists then our perception of the physical world bears to a real physical world. Exactly right. So I'm not saying that you know, evolution has endowed all of us to be you know, mathematical geniuses that see all the truths of mathematics. Not by a long shot. Every once in a while you have you know, a, a, a brilliant mathematician um, you know, who comes along, but most of us have just a, a modest endowment that was selected because we needed just a modest amount of mathematics and logic to reason about the fitness consequences of our actions. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the interesting thing. Uh, I, I, I found it beautiful because if the evolutionary simulations had shown that natural selection systematically eradicates true logic and math, just like it eradicates true perceptions, mm -hmm. then I would be in a position of shooting myself in the foot. That would be a self-refuting use of, of evolutionary theory. Mm -hmm. So I found it quite interesting that the theory of evolution does uniformly shoot down true perception, but it allows pockets in which limited amounts of logic, limited amounts of mathematics can be used for limited species-specific needs. Mm -hmm. And then those genes, you know, that here's the beauty of mutation, that every once in a while you, you get, you know, you know, a von Neumann <laughs> who comes along and has just the right collection of mutations such that all of a sudden the mathematical prowess is, is spectacular. Mm -hmm. Again, it's finite, but it's, it's, it's more than most of us. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, when you say that, uh, I don't want to dwell on this, but when you say that uh, in your simulations, veridical perceptions are completely extinguished through evolution. They are driven to extinction, you know, true perceptions. It makes me think that I'm... I misunderstood a little what your simulations are up to. When I asked you earlier why you bother to do the evolutionary simulations, because, I mean, it seems to me that that all depends on whether you posit, whether you assume that veridical, uh, that, that, the, um, that, the, that the real world corresponds to the perceived world. I mean, when there's a discrepancy... Uh, between veridical perception and fitness-conducing perception, we know which one will win, but it seems to me you have to assume that there's a discrepancy between those two. You don't know for sure that there will be a discrepancy, right? Well, so, so what, we're about to publish a theorem. So we have the simulations that I've published before, but we've now proven a theorem. And, and, and the theorem basically says for generically chosen worlds, mm -hmm. And we, if you want, we can get into the mathematics, but, you know... No, what we I think we'll pass, thanks. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll pass, yeah. So for generically chosen worlds and generically chosen fitness functions in those worlds, uh -huh. um, an organism that um, sees reality as it is in that, in the, in that world mm -hmm. can never be more fit than an equally complex organism that sees none of the reality in that world and is just tuned to the fitness function. And as the complexity of the world increases and as the complexity of the organisms increase, the chance that even by accident the, the truth-seeking organism can ever win in the evolutionary competition goes to zero. Because the perception of reality is costly? Is, it is costly and it's, and it's irrelevant. It, it, Strictly it, it, speaking, yeah. It's completely irrelevant. Although... So, although well, again, uh, we shouldn't dwell on this, but if it turns out that veridical and, and, and utility maximizing perceptions correspond, then it's not irrelevant. But, but I, 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 I yeah, you can... you're, you're right. You're absolutely right about that. But that's why I was talking about generically. So mm -hmm. for generically chosen worlds and generically chosen fitness functions, which, which, which means that, I mean, what you said is strictly true, but the probability of that happening is zero. So the, the probability that well, a that, fitness that's function, what seems more like an assumption than a consequence of a simulation, but maybe I'm wrong. Well, it it, it comes down to what um, I'll give you a concrete idea about why it's more than just an assumption. That is, it's more of a mathematical property. Mm -hmm. Suppose that I have just the, the real line, just a, a line. Mm -hmm. So I have an order that you know zero is less than one, less than two, less than a hundred. 
right? So maybe that, that represents resources. Zero means no resource, no, no water. 100 means a lot of water and so mm -hmm. forth. And now I ask possible fitness functions. Maybe a fitness function might be um, that more water is, is more fit. So zero is very, very low fitness water, and 100 is very, very high fitness water. Mm -hmm. And so that, that fitness function is monotonic with the, the amount of water. That's one kind of fitness function. Mm -hmm. Another kind of fitness function might be a Gaussian, where like uh, uh, an intermediate value of water, like 50, is really fit, mm -hmm. but 100 is too much, right? You might drown. Zero is too little. You might die of thirst. And so you, you could have that kind of fitness function. Mm -hmm. And you can just ask yourself, um, what are all the possible shapes of fitness functions? And, and so you can look at the collection of all possible fitness functions and then ask, out of that whole collection of fitness functions, which fitness functions happen to be monotonic with the truth, with the reality, such that if you were tuned to fitness, you would also happen to be tuned to reality? This is a clean mathematical question, and it turns out those have probability zero. Okay. So if you're tuned to fitness, yes, there is a, there is a probability zero chance that you will be tuned to reality. But it is probability zero. Probability one, you will not be tuned to reality. And then that's the sense in which I say the probability is zero that natural selection will favor a veridical perception. Okay. I think I'm going to have to review this part of the conversation later and, and try to try to grok it. But um, okay. Uh, but l let's um, in the in the time remaining, let's do a couple of things. You've got an actual theory. I'm going to turn right here. A, a theory some, of the. Are you going to show us the theory on the board for those of I'm us? I'm just going to get a little bit more light on the room here. <laughs> oh, I see. I thought I thought, we, I, thought I was uh, going to have to look at mathematical symbols. I'm I'm relieved to, to hear that you're just turning up the light. So so you have a, a, an actual. Uh, mathematical formula, kind of about uh, what 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 con that, that reflects uh, the relationship between consciousness and and, and the world. I guess um, the uh, why don't you see if you can just put it into words uh, to and that will be an imperfect rendering, I'm sure. Um, and then I'd like you to. Uh, Discuss the sense in which you say it's testable. But for starters, why don't you just try to, uh, without hope of complete success, you know, give us at least the flavor of, of the mathematical theory, what it, what it is trying to do. That's right. So the mathematical theory, um, I'll just say first it's in the spirit of um, Church Turing, uh, of Turing, when he came up with the Turing machine for, for computation. It's a very, very simple formalism, and the, it's, you know, it's five or six little mathematical components that that are apparently universal anything that can be computed can be computed with this universal Turing machine with, with a simple Turing machine mm -hmm. and the idea is to come up with a simple formalism as well for consciousness and and so the, the components of this formalism there are uh, each conscious agent has a set of experiences that are possible for it mm -hmm. so it could be a small set, or it could be up to a countable infinity mm -hmm. of, of, of discrete conscious experiences it could have. Um, based on those experiences, it can make decisions about how it wants to act. Mm -hmm. It has a collection of actions that it can take. Um, and then, based on the action it chooses, it then can act on the world, where it doesn't know what the world is. <laughs> All the agent knows is it, it can choose an action, and, and it does that action, but it doesn't know what the world is. And then the world feeds back um, and changes the perceptions that the, the agent has. And the only other part of the structure then is a discrete counter. Every time the agent gets a new percept, a new experience, this counter increments. So the agent has, so to spell it out, there's a space that I call X of experiences, a space G uh, of actions that the agent can take, a mapping D, which is the decision Given my experience, what action do I want to choose? There's mapping A that says, given the action, I'm going to now act on the world. So A is the action on the world. And then there's a map P from the world, which is the perception map, where the world then changes my experiences. Mm -hmm. And then there's a counter T that just you know, you know, is a discrete integer counter um, that you know, increments every time I have an experience. That's the entire formalism. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some mathematical details about the nature of these maps. Technically, they're Markovian kernels, um, and the, the spaces are, are measurable spaces. 
and having said that, no, I actually told you the entire mathematical structure. Right, and and it kind of roughly speaking seems comprehensible and makes sense, with a possible exception of the part where you realize that the world is itself conscious agents. Whereas normally we think of the world, we think of our consciousness in here, there's the world out there, and I think this is the, um, you know, there's a kind of recursive quality to the theory, you know, which is not shocking when you think about it. I, I mean, it's not shocking that the correct theory of consciousness might be incomprehensible when you think about it, you know, because uh, the, the, the problem the problem is deep, but 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 it, it, it's true that that's kind of the in a way the least intuitive. That, that that's a stumbling block to ready intuitive comprehension of your theory, right? Is this kind of self-referential feature that 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 the world is not just this world out there; it, it is its self-conscious agents. Although again, conscious agents needn't be organic beings. No, no, there there anything that satisfies the mathematical definition is a conscious agent. Mm -hmm. And the idea is to think about objective reality as a big social network. That's the idea. It's, it's a bunch of interacting conscious agents. Hmm. And the dynamics is much like the dynamics of social networks. And the evolution of consciousness will be very much like the evolution of social networks and social network theory. Hmm. And one of the, the idea is going to be that by looking at the evolution of, of social interactions among the conscious agents and then projecting that evolution back into the space-time interface, say, of Homo sapiens, mm -hmm. I should get back Darwinian evolution. That's going to be a constraint on my theory of the evolution of consciousness in this big social network. Mm -hmm. So that, that so it's, it's going to be very, very testable. If I have a theory of conscious evolution, which is going to be a graph theoretic theory, mm -hmm. uh, very much like we use graph theoretic in, uh, analyses of, of interactions on, on the internet and so forth to understand why some some websites get a lot of hits and others are you know less less hits who's got more influence who's got less all the the work that's been done on social networks is going to apply here it'll be uh, an evolution of conscious agents and that evolution when projected back into a particular space-time interface of homo sapiens better give us back the Darwinian evolution we know and love or the theory of conscious evolution is wrong. Okay. So that's going to be one way that we're going to have um, testable predictions. So that's an example of the testability. Absolutely. So, so wait, does the testability lie in the in, in the more fine articulation of the formalized theory in a way that succeeds in corresponding to the dynamics of natural selection or something, or is that... That, that, that will be one of the many ways that will be tested, but that, uh -huh. I definitely will want to show how the theory of evolution of consciousness in this, in this framework of conscious agents um, gives, gives detailed understanding of how, why we see Darwinian evolution uh, when we look at it through the lens of space and time. Mm -hmm. But that's not the only thing. I'll, I'll, that's not the only constraint. I will need to be able to make predictions about the dynamics of space-time, for example, at the Planck scale. If I can't do that, if mm -hmm. I can't actually make new predictions about quantum gravity from this and and understand how interactions of conscious agents can create interfaces of space-time mm -hmm. and make new predictions about the dynamics of space-time at the Planck scale, then once again I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. And there are other predictions that come out of this that have already been tested, um, that sort of come out of just the evolutionary game stuff. I mean, if, if, if I'm correct, and space and time and physical objects are just the wrong language to describe reality as it is, there's a clean prediction that follows from that. And the prediction is this. And, and this prediction, by the way, has caused lots of um, um, comments on the Internet. People just don't understand this, so I'll, I'll try to explain it. A uh, clean prediction that a physical object like an electron has no position and no momentum and no spin at all when it's not observed. And that's a clean prediction of what I'm saying. If, if I'm wrong about that, then everything I'm saying is wrong. Well, something like that had been suggested by people who all along had responded to <clears throat> one of the mysteries of quantum physics by saying that it is the observation of the system that forces the uh, wave function or whatever to collapse into definite form, right? So, so this is a little like that, although maybe not exactly like it. it it's, a bit, it's a bit like that, although some quantum physicists have tried to keep a physical reality. For example, mm -hmm. um, Bohm 
you know, tried to keep a, a, a genuine position and velocity for a particle even when it was not observed mm -hmm. in, in, in his approach. So quantum physicists have been um, you know, not completely in agreement about how to interpret the quantum formalism on, on this regard. Mm -hmm. but, but the evolutionary games forced me to take a strong position. Um, if space and time and physical objects, position, momentum, is the wrong language to describe reality, then I have, I'm forced to interpret the quantum formalism and, and my own theory to say an electron cannot have a position or momentum when it's not observed. If it does, then um, there's no reason to listen to me any further. I, I'm completely wrong. And, and the objection that people have to this is they say, well, how in the world can that be a testable statement? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're not looking, if you're not observing, then how can you know what's going on? And, and so there's two, two ways to think about this. First, take the opposite statement that everybody believes, that a position does, that the electron does have a position and a spin when it's not observed, right? Mm -hmm. Or that a rock has a position when it's not observed. Everybody thinks, of course, that's a genuine scientific statement and, and it's probably true. But we can't verify it. Yeah, the question would be, how, if, if it's scientific, then it has to be falsifiable. And how would you falsify it? Well, you'd have to show that it's not the case that the electron doesn't have a position when it's not observed. In other words, my hypothesis needs to be part of that whole package. Yeah, but if you set up a video camera to record the rock when you're not there and you come back, what would you say about that evidence? Would you say that the video camera was itself conscious or would you say that there's some kind of re retrospective effect of consciousness or what? Well, um, you don't know about anything about the rock until you yourself view the video. True. So you don't know, you don't, the assumption that the video exists when you're not looking is part of that whole assumption that you're making there. So, so it's, it's a far more clever experiment that has to be done to test this hypothesis. Just, just taking a video and then looking at the video later is, is not going to do it because the, the question still arises, did the camera itself exist when you weren't looking? Uh -huh. Every time I look, I see a camera and I see a video. But that doesn't mean that a camera and a video exist when I don't look. Right? That, that doesn't logically follow. And, and so it turned out, by the way, very, very bright people um, like Polly and others thought that this question was not a scientific question, that it was like asking how many angels dance on the head of a pen, mm -hmm. you know, to ask, does an electron have a position when it's not observed? But it turns out John Bell in 1962, 63, something like that, showed that this is not an angels dancing on the head of a pen kind of question. It's an empirical question. He came up with very interesting mathematics called Bell's Inequalities mm -hmm. that gives you a precise way to test the hypothesis that an electron does not have a dynamical property like spin when it's not observed. Clean. It's one of the deepest um, successes of the human mind is, is Bell's theorem. And in the years since Bell, Bell published that, there have been over a dozen very, very careful tests. And in every case, the, the experiments come out compatible with the interpretation that an electron has no dynamical properties when it's not observed. Now, no experiment ever forces a theoretical interpretation. I mean, that, that's just part of elementary philosophy of science. No data ever force a scientific theory to be, you know, true. There's always an infinite number of theories that are compatible with any data. So I'm being very, very careful when I say that all of these experiments have, are always, the, the results are always compatible with the interpretation that an electron does not have a position or a spin when it's not observed. Right, and in fact, a, a, a probably more common interpretation of some of this stuff is that what forces the electron to assume a definite, like, location and, and, and everything is interaction with a macroscopic physical measuring device not observation by what we think of as a conscious being per se? That's, a, that's an alternative interpretation, right? That, that's been one of the interpretations that quantum physicists have tried to give. In, in, in particular, Bohr, with the Copenhagen interpretation, tried, tried to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm taking a very, very different tack. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that electrons uh, and any physical objects that have position and momentum and, and so forth are just a human species-specific representation of a reality that's utterly different. Um, and so it's no surprise, since electrons are nothing but our symbols, 
it's no surprise that those symbols don't exist when we don't token them, when we don't observe. They only exist when we observe because they are the symbols that represent our observations. Okay. So I think you've given us plenty to ponder, and I myself, I'm sure, should listen to this conversation several times and ponder it before interrogating you further. But final, final question. Yes. Has this, your view of the world, affected the way you live in any way? Well, it's, it's, it has in, in a couple ways. First, it's very painful um, because I'm, like everybody else, a naive realist at heart. I mean, my, my default mode is that uh, 3D space and objects in space-time are the reality. Um, and it's when I put on my thinking cap that, that I have to recognize otherwise. But, you know, frankly, when I go outside and look, it looks like the sun is going around the earth. And it, uh, every time I look, step outside, it, it, it looks that way. And I know otherwise. And so, you know, it's, it's painful in the same way that it was painful for us to give up a geocentric universe. I mean, people died and were burned at the stake for that. Um, and it's, it's sort of painful psychologically for me to give this up. But, and slowly my perceptions of the world are, are changing. Um, but it's, it's, it's interesting. You know, evolution um, shaped us with symbols that we have to take very, very seriously, right? If we don't take them seriously, we'll die. And, and we were given the symbols that we have um, because they're what we need to survive. So we have to take them very, very seriously. And for some reason, we have a penchant for taking them literally. I see a snake. That symbol means I should. There are things I should not do. I shouldn't. Well, it's grab more efficient it. to take them literally. Uh, just think of the time you've wasted not taking them literally. Right. right, right. I mean, from evolution's point of view, you're better off not, you know, yeah, wasting right. the time. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Why waste the time wondering about it? You just get out of the way of the snake. Don't step off the cliff. Right. Step out of the way of the train. Um, but, but strictly speaking, taking them seriously does not mean we have to take them literally. And so that. That dissociation is emotionally wrenching, and so that that's affected me that way. Um, but I guess the other effect is it's um, made life far more interesting. Um, there's a lot to explore, a lot I don't know, and things that I thought I knew I um, I've had to give up, and so it makes life far more interesting for me as well. Okay, well, we'll leave it there for now. I may uh, again, after pondering this, ask you if you have time for another conversation, yes. but. You've given us plenty to think about. Thanks for taking the time. Thanks, uh, I encourage people to uh, look at anything you've written on this. You're Happily, you're writing a, a book uh, for, I yes. think, a popular audience. It'll be a while before that's out, but, yes. but help is on the way. Uh, <laughs> yes. and, 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 and thanks so much, and, uh, and good luck with it. Thank you very much, Bob. Good to talk. Same here.